Hello, hello, hello. Roger was just telling me how much he misses me saying that to him at least once a week. It is the special pandemic edition of the Benefit Roast. I cannot believe that I had to say that, but that is the reality and we face that reality. Roger Baines here. He's an expert in benefits, health benefits, innovative solutions, self-funding, and he is going to share with us some updates about what's going on. If you'd like to contribute to the discussion, we'd love to have you ask your questions, make your comments. You can go into the chat box on your lower right, type in a message, and we will see it, and we will work it into the discussion as it falls into place. So Roger, without further ado, I'm so excited to be on here with you. Go get them. Bob, I'm really disappointed that you're not starting me out with any uh, insightful questions to give us a start, but we'll come back to that later on. First of all, thank you everyone for coming and joining us today. I know it's been some very crazy times in this business, so we're going to try and make sure we cover just routinely some of the things that are going on, and many of which you're already aware of, you already know what's happening. But in relation to our health plans and what our experience has been, we want to cover that briefly and then talk a little bit about where we're going and where the whole industry is going to be going over the next couple of years in response to this. So first of all, Revolution Series Health Plans. Any of you that have any business in force with us know that we have made great accommodations. We have done everything we can to work with our groups on deferred payment. We've even got some success stories where groups use a surplus from last year that was due. We released that surplus early so they could make their April payments. And moving into May, they can move their May payment off to June. So we've done some really creative things in that regard. And you've all seen our memos and our addendums that we put out to the SPDs. So all of our SPDs have been automatically updated according to the requirements under the federal guidelines and some additional considerations that we've made. One of the things that challenges and has challenged many of us in this time is furloughs and layoffs and the, and the discussion about what happens for reinstatement of those employees if they've been furloughed and laid off and they lose their benefits. When they come back, what do we do? You know, many of us are looking at the old days when if you leave the group for a period of time, you drop off your health plan, you need to complete a whole new application and re-enroll in the benefit plan. And so we have done everything that we can do to give the employers the latitude of up to a 90-day leave of absence. They do have to go on record with that. They have to notify us and they have to notify their employees in order to stay in compliance with ERISA and everything else, even amidst this going on. But we're allowing groups the ability to extend that leave of absence. So we'll request it and we haven't denied a request yet. So they request that leave of absence, they can extend it and allow employees to stay on the health plan even if they're not actively working. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge is when they come back. And the third challenge is deferral of payment. And that deferral of payment is becoming a challenge for carriers all over the country, as you can imagine, because we have a multitude of different events that we have to deal with. Fortunately, in our world, self-funded, the deferral of payments is a little bit easier. We're able to defer the fixed costs and claims funding if their account has funding in it and a surplus already and only worried about that claims funding when in fact we come into a shortfall. So there's been a lot of really good things that we've been doing and a lot of great changes. So if you have questions about those, let me know. We can certainly introduce that. In addition to that, we're doing some new options in response to this. We've actually gone to carriers and gotten our approval to offer a stop loss contract that has no minimum aggregate. Most of you know that self-funded contracts are annual deals on stop loss premium and they have an annual minimum aggregate or claims funding. And that minimum claims funding, if you lay off 100 employees for three months, can be affected. So we're first working on consideration for the COVID virus. And second, we're releasing a new rider option where somebody can just pay slightly higher premium and aggregate factor and not have any minimum aggregate. So that's a pioneering thing. I don't know that anybody in the stop loss business offers that other than us at this point. So that's Roger, a pretty change. Yes, Bob. I, I was gonna say, you went through that really quickly. Well, I'm and trying. And I tried to follow it. Can you break that down a little bit and get a little more granular? You, 
you gave it the headline approach. I think you might want to give us like the paragraph explanation approach, if you would. Well, I can try that. I'm trying not to get too granular today because we promised this was only going to be 30 minutes. But let's let's go back and do that a little bit anyway. First, and are you meaning all of it or just the last points, Bob? Just the last part, I'm sorry, just the last little bit. Okay, so last part, in self-funded contracts, when you sign on for a year, you typically have an aggregate exposure or your maximum amount of claims funding that's required. And no matter what happens to your enrollment, your minimum still remains at at least 80% of that, and some carriers, 100% of that, all depending on the contract that you're in. So during this COVID virus, we've been successful in getting carriers to be more lenient on that, understanding that this year is going to be different because of significant layoffs during a period of time of this national emergency. So we're getting ease on that. And secondly, what we've done for any clients that are ever worried about this ever happening again or this type of occurrence, we've created a specific benefit option or not a benefit to the employee, but for the employer, a rider to their stop loss contract that says you don't have any minimum aggregate. So your aggregate is based on your actual enrollment month over month for the year. So at the end of the year, your actual enrollment dictates what your aggregate is and there is no minimum. So that's a 3% add to the rates, but for some, that's a security blanket that could be very comforting. Now, also, it's important to note, Bob, that that minimum aggregate isn't so important when you have stop loss coverage in force anyway, because oftentimes, if you had 300 employees and you dropped to 100, your claims are also dropping considerably. So even though you have minimum claims funding, when those claims don't happen, you're gonna get all that funding back anyway, or, or whatever portion is left over, you're getting back anyway. So it's an interesting uh, development that we're seeing in how this works. And like I said, we had one of the customers that I worked actively with in, in the restaurant industry that obviously was completely shut down. And in that scenario, we've been able to extend coverage for those employees, use last year's fund and the extension of fixed costs for another month to really make it as easy as we possibly could on that employer to do what they decide to do as far as how long they can keep their employees on the books. Of course, nationally, the payroll protection program has helped a lot of employers stay on the books as well. So it would be interesting to hear from, from members out there what they're seeing, but we've not seen radical drops in our business. We have seen layoffs affect some of our enrollment statistics. And, and some of our larger clients in the restaurant or hospitality business have seen that. But at large, overall, we've not seen significant cuts in employment. Even though the news is, is very high on that and we see a lot of changes, I'm not seeing that. So I'm not Roger, sure. could, could it be, Roger, that it's lagging behind a little bit because the Baltimore, Washington area, historically, whenever employment starts to slide, is always two to three months behind. And some of the economists say that it's often because of the government funding of Social Security and defense that it just lags a bit behind. And where you are, I'd be curious if that's a factor or if employers are holding on, waiting to see if they get the PPP funding before they make those decisions, which would mean you might start to see it this next month. Well, I, I agree with you, Bob, that that is a big thing. I know the PPP program has been prolonged and extended and wondering if they're gonna do a third round, but even those first two rounds, you could have applied on the first day and still be waiting potentially to get your answer and know exactly where you're going. So that's certainly an important question. And I believe, that there is a certain rolling issue that's coming into the mix that we'll have to look at. I think that our revenue as insurance professionals will in fact drop more by midsummer than it has so far, but then the recoil could be just as quickly back. So everybody's holding on to keep employees in benefits as long as they can. Employees are paying for their COBRA premium as long as they can. And then if things really get tough and they drop coverage short term, they're going to want to get it reinstated as fast as they can as soon as we open the economy back up. So I'm not sure that it's going to be as tragic as it may have sounded in the beginning, but we're all still looking for that crystal ball to see just how it plays out. 
I cut you off, Roger. Did you have more to go through or was that pretty much it and you were looking for questions? No, you're good. Go ahead. Okay. I, I was going to ask you a question that I got from someone who's, who said I knew some stuff about insurance, which is risky, but they were asking what would happen if we had another big shutdown in the fall? So things get back to normal and then we have a big shutdown in the fall. Would that put insurance in a difficult position? Well, insurance is in a difficult position already, and we'll come to that in a few minutes when we start talking about what we really foresee going forward. If we were to see a relapse or a new wave of this virus penetrating the population once again and really starting to take hold again, we're going to see some pretty significant changes in how we handle that. I don't anticipate another major shutdown unless or until it comes from the global warming advocates that are saying look how much cleaner the air is and how cooler the temperatures are since we've taken all the cars off the road so i'm not sure that a total shutdown is the most appropriate and most measured response based upon a newly educated population we now understand the risks more we understand containing the risks more. We understand protecting ourselves from the risks more. And I would think that we would look at a layered or even staged type of shutdown for any future pandemic, because I think that what we're doing from a, from a government standpoint on funding and aid packages is absolutely unsustainable. We can't do it over and over without risking the the complete devaluation of the American dollar, and of course, skyrocketing escalation of inflation at the end of all this printing of money. So I'm not so sure, Bob, that we'll see the same economic shutdown, even if the virus comes back. And then let me go to a bigger question, which is, are we, can we expect that rates for health insurance are going to go way, way up as insurance companies have to find a way to re recoup this? Well, it's, it's funny that you would ask that question because the answer is yes, but not for the same reasons you might think. The answer is yes, simply because they can. Um, you know, you look at all of the aid that's been provided to hospitals, billions and billions of dollars of these federal aid packages have been going to the hospital industry as well. Rates have been allowed to increase for COVID treatment, even in a state of Maryland, where we have regulation of the hospital rates, they've allowed higher rates for COVID treatment because of the scramble that we're in and the loss of elective procedures. But if you really think about it, when it's all said and done, the hospitals are getting paid for the vast majority of the care they deliver, whether it's through federal programs, or whether it's through insurance companies paying the rates, and the rates could be very, very high. Nonetheless, rate increases are coming, and they're gonna come because the hospitals want more money and the insurance companies are gonna to have to pay more money. And in fact, the insurance companies are going to experience the same kind of rolling lag in claims experience that we might be receiving in enrollment experience. Meaning, not all the COVID claims are in and settled yet. You know, the thousands of people that are hospitalized around this country haven't been billed yet. And when those bills start coming in, the numbers projected by some of the actuarial firms are astronomical. We saw one firm quote, a minimum of $9,000 per employee per year increased in healthcare costs because of COVID in the next renewal as a best case scenario. That's a Big number, Bob, really big number. And that's their best case prediction from the largest actuarial firm in the country. Their worst case, we don't even want to talk about. So should, when you, should brokers start talking to their clients about this and informing them of those numbers and getting them to be aware of this? Because my fear is we're going to get to renewal time and we're going to, there's going to be a huge sticker shock. All of us as professional advisors need to be talking to our customers about this stuff every single day. You know, we suspended the benefit roast 
during this time because we had to sit back and look and determine what we're doing. But at the same time, we kept up with our email campaigns and our efforts to continually communicate all of the changes as have every carrier. So much so that many of these emails are probably deleted by, by all of us instantaneously because we've read so much now about the COVID-19 response and what we're doing that it's very difficult to read more unless it is really capturing us with some new level of information or evidence. So as we look toward what's happening in this, yes, we have to talk to our customers about it, especially any of those customers that are ready to talk about it. And any of them that are up for renewal now may be escaping the next 12 months. You know, it, it's funny, during the Obamacare era of the implementation during the after the institution of the ACA, a lot of the regs that were kicking in on January 1 created early renewals on December 1. Well, it may not be that imprudent to start renewing plans June and July 1, and, and because pretty soon rates are going to start to recoil. If you're renewing in the fall or the end of the year, like everyone else is, insurance companies are going to be anticipating that in those renewals very, very quickly. And so you're going to see some spikes in renewals that you have to look at. And that kind of brings us into the discussion, Bob, of what do we do now? You know, and I think what's important is that medical underwriting, evidence of insurability, self-funded plans that are looking at experience rating and implementing a lot of different managed care components and cost control components are going to become more important in the coming years than they have been even in the past and in the current. We know they've been taking off since the passage of the ACA. We know they've been growing, but now if you're looking at the fully insured industry, about ready to take significant double digit rate increases above what might be expected, now you're talking about the best of the best groups nearing that breaking point and needing rate relief. And to get that rate relief, they need the most innovative and aggressive managed care techniques and cost control techniques. It's not just managing care, it's managing cost, it's managing providers and making sure we get people to the right place at the right time. So these are really critical components of what we need to look at going forward. We, we every day it seems are getting some ridiculously expensive prescription drug, it's 75% off because of managed care, introducing and finding other ways to get to it. And those things are gonna happen. But one of the things that you're gonna see that doesn't happen, and this is probably the industry that's going to be hurt most by this, is medical tourism. No one is gonna travel outside of this country for healthcare in the near future given the concerns about this type of infection, not only the lingering results of the infection, but the travel itself. It's gonna change people's perspective. And I think that's gonna be one of the industries that's hurt more than any. And one of the cost saving techniques that takes more heat. I mean, Bob, you and I talked about it in the past. Would you fly to Mexico this week for healthcare? No, probably not, but I might fly to Canada. <laughs> okay, so I, I'd be surprised you'd fly anywhere at this point to get medical care outside of your, your local environment. I guess it depends how much you're saving. Frankly, well, it's a risk, you know, it's a risk reward equation. If the, if the cost of the medicine and all that is $200,000, I might go in, in that situation. I think plenty of people would. Well, in that, in that scenario, that's true, but most often covered employees don't have that kind of maximum amount of pocket anyway the employer does so now right. it's up to the employee whether they want to execute medical tourism for some advantages maybe eliminating a five thousand dollar out of pocket max but not this whole two hundred thousand dollars is the employee so the employee shares much less so let's put it in context if the worst case scenario was a three thousand dollar incentive would someone with a need for significant medical expense actually travel to another country to get that procedure performed given the current state of affairs? Probably not. Right, and that's my assumption as well. So I think you're gonna see some pretty significant injury to the medical tourism field, which is unfortunate because it could be a very valuable lesson for America to understand how to get care elsewhere and what it costs. But 
we will continue to, to follow that element of it. But back to looking at a group's status, you know, your group now needs to know the under, and understand their medical situation and their potential cost of care more than ever before. So in being able to do that, it creates the opportunity for you to provide continued benefits to employees at a much improved cost if you're able to introduce all the appropriate things. And many groups are gonna to need to remove themselves from the community rating type of impetus. And even some of the insurance ratings that you get in the, in the mid-range market in 50 to 250, where you still have a significant insurance component from the insurance carriers blending your rates with everyone else. It, people are gonna find that to be less and less attractive as we go. So we just have to be very careful. So Roger, it sounds like your group risk assessment would be really valuable for people right now more than ever for them to, for brokers to share with their groups and get them to go through and just figure out where they actually stand and why their rates today are the way they are. Is that correct? I, I think the understanding is the number one thing. Uh, and once they understand the decision, whether they wanna go through a group risk assessment and take a better look at their group and consider self-funded as an option and an alternate to what they've been doing in the fully insured market, that's certainly a question. You know, I have one comment on screen from David and David says non-essential travel to Canada is not allowed. And I, and I understand that I'm kind of anticipating and what I'm trying to suggest, David, is that as those restrictions are eased, even in six months or a year from now, people are going to be more resistant to travel in general, much less travel for medical care. Um, at least I, sus I suppose that, that would be my assumption. So we'll have to take a look at and see how that goes. Did you see that other question, Roger? Uh, yeah, I see it on my screen. Dan is, Dan is mentioning that there's talk in the industry of double digit increases over the next several years in the fully insured market, directly as a result of COVID-19. And what is the prediction on how stop loss for carriers will react based on the particulars in their business model? Well. Stop loss carriers are at risk just like a fully insured carrier is when you're talking about a significant increase in overall claims. The difference is maybe the predictability and understanding the risk that they're taking in the beginning and where those risks are going. Also, the big part of that question is are these rate increases intended to recover from the injury received today or are they predicting future costs? I think you're gonna see a lot of rate increases that are what I would call recovery rate increases. Insurance companies needing to put some money back into their coffers because of the big losses they take for the expense of this treatment going forward. So we have to look at that type of scenario and determine just how much of it is predictable future increase in costs that we're raising premium for, and how much of that is actually absorbing some of the losses from the previous year so that we can continue to pay claims on a solid basis. Any of it that's recovery, you're gonna see groups flock to self-funded. Self-funded doesn't have that same recovery advantage that a fully insured carrier does. You know, if, if, if you're in the world of self-funding, you're gonna pay for your rates for what they are today, not for what they were last year. Um, and in as much as the same scenario, if you have bad claims this year, you're gonna to move to fully insured if, if you need to in, in future years. So there's a lot of things to consider in that scenario. Stop loss carriers in their business model are gonna be looking and are looking very, very closely at this. The one thing I can tell you, however, is that because of the freeze on all of the other non-essential care that's being that, that would have been delivered, all the elective procedures, because of that slowdown, which is just starting to open up again, because of that slowdown, recent claims experience has been absolutely ridiculously low. Unless you're a carrier covering the COVID claims, you're not paying much else because nobody's in the hospital for any of those elective procedures. So it's gonna be interesting to see whether these predictive models run similar to what we see in press conferences every day where we projected a quarter of a million people are going to die and maybe only 100,000 in the end. We don't know where those numbers are gonna come up, but it's the same with the medical expense. We're not sure yet. And the delay of many elective procedures could have 
the effect of increased complications and increased costs, or people that decide not to do the procedure at all, and, and who knows what. So it's a really tough, tough target to throw a dart at, but I think that the stop loss carriers are as well positioned as a fully insured carrier to go forward and offer competitive coverage and maybe have some advantages that the fully insured carriers don't. So I think you might see the fully insured market become even more competitive than it has been. So Roger, let me see if I can do this. You, you and I met years ago when I was editing some insurance newspapers, trade journals, and you and I would talk and you were always like the guy who gave me the headline weeks before it actually happened. The headline I would use today would be renew early if you can because the rates are going up. The other things I would put in a story if I were writing a story would be that rates are going to go up. People are probably going to move from fully insured to self-funding and self-funding to fully insured, depending on their situation and their claims issues. Medical tourism is a real challenge. The cost of elective surgeries hasn't really been factored in because it's a gray area. And as we look forward, <coughs> self-funding is probably in really good shape going forward because there's more flexibility and people are paying for the rates based on today's situation, not yesterday's or tomorrow. How did I do summarizing that article? Well, I think that's that's pretty good, Bob. I think that's, you know, we're, we're doing this kind of ad hoc. I didn't script any of this today. So hearing you recant it to me is, is really a good exercise. I think it's, it's valuable uh, for all of us to contemplate these things. And I think much of that you'll find is, is going to come true. Okay. Well, if we, um, do we, I don't see any other questions, Roger, why don't we do something crazy and close a couple of minutes early? We rarely do that. This will be a, uh, a special treat for people. We'll give them an extra three minutes to go out and call one of their clients and update them on the situation with this new information. I want to thank Roger, as always. You've been reading the tea leaves for years, and today you really read a lot of tea leaves for us, and I appreciate it. I know everyone on this call appreciates it. And we will be back with another benefit roast when the situation warrants. Right, Roger? Yeah, we're, we're anticipating probably not more often than every two weeks for a little while, but we'll let you know if we're going to be back in two weeks pretty soon. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Be happy. Be healthy. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.